Well, ahead of the World Economic Forum annual summit in Davos, Switzerland next week, which we'll be covering extensively on the ground, the World Economic Forum has produced its annual Global Risks Report 2024. It's a critical study that captures insights from nearly 1,500 global experts. The report analyzes global risks through three time frames to support decision makers in balancing current crises and a longer sense of priorities, long term priorities. The report indicates a deteriorating global outlook from a short and long term perspective and there is unfortunately plenty to be worried about. What we can now do before we are joined by Sadia Zahidi, the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum, is to take a look at some of the key findings which are these. Over the next two years, five of the top ten risks for the world will be number one, misinformation and disinformation. Number two, extreme weather events. Number three, societal polarization. Number four, cyber insecurity. And number five, interstate armed conflict. Now this changes over a period of ten years. What does it change to? Well, the biggest concern will be extreme weather events. Number two, critical changes to the Earth systems. Number three, biodiversity loss and an ecosystem collapse. Number four, a shortage of natural resources and then misinformation and disinformation. Note how weather and environmental impacts dominate the biggest causes of concern about 10 years from now. So what is the overall picture? Well, over the next two years, 3% of those who've participated in the report say that there are global catastrophic risks looming. This is bad news indeed. 54% say things will be turbulent where upheavals and an elevated risk of global catastrophes is possible. While over the next 10 years, 17% predict global catastrophic risks, while 46% say that there will be upheavals and an elevated risk. Clearly, a jump in the most dire warnings. Well, joining us now, Sadia Zahidi, the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Thanks very much, Sadia, for, for being with us. How does the report express concerns over a persistent cost of living crisis? It's one of the points that you've raised. What are some of the most glaring examples of this? Thank you. I, I think maybe just adding a bit to, to what you were saying in terms of the outlook, um, only about 15% uh, of people currently have a positive outlook or an optimistic outlook, and that shrinks to about 8% when it comes to um, 10 years out. So I think um, overall, uh, the very few optimists um, become even smaller over the course of the next decade. Now, in terms of cost of living crisis, um, it used to be the number one risk last year. Mm -hmm. It is now down to number four when it comes to this present year. But I think what we can't forget is that inflation is still number seven in the two-year outlook. There's still fears of an economic downturn. That's number nine. And there continues to be a sense that there's very little economic opportunity for many people, and they're sort of stalled when it comes to social mobility. So all of that together is showing up. And of course, that looks different in different parts of the world. In much of Africa, there's deep concerns around an economic downturn. Similarly, for example, in the United States, India is very different. It's a bright spot. Um, that's one of the few places where you're expecting more than 6% growth. So it really depends on where you are in the world. But we do also look, what does that mean for the 10-year time frame? Could we be looking at a bifurcation between mostly the global south having living standards that become stalled or stuck where they are and the global north being also where it is, but that inequality stays and we don't see the convergence that we were uh, uh, predicting previously? So that's one of the longer-term risks that we're seeing when it sure. comes to living standards in the economy. Uh, you know, Given what we are actually seeing now um, from a global standpoint, a lot of uncertainty, for example, in the Red Sea, uh, we're seeing a lot of uncertainty uh, in West Asia as well. Do you believe that these are um, some of the most fundamental concerns or threats which have gone or perhaps will go in defining what global risks are over the next one year? Yeah, I mean, if we just look at the start of the 2020s, there have been three successive shocks. There's been the shock of the pandemic, there's been the shock of the, the war in Ukraine, and now um, the latest, uh, the conflict in the Middle East. 
Uh, it's very clear that interstate armed conflict is top of minds of many of the responders. In fact, the survey was completed in September before the outbreak of hostilities and still interstate armed conflict is number five in the two year time frame. So people are deeply concerned um, about the geopolitical fractures, but also what does that then mean in terms of the geoeconomic cleavages and how um, countries can continue to trade with each other, how we can continue to have knowledge transfer and technology transfer. So some major concerns when it comes to the spillover of conflict to the economy and what that means for people. So again, if some of this continues, we can expect that shipping prices could rise so high that we again have a new series of inflation starting for which there's very little control. Sadi, you've also looked extensively at, uh, at AI and uh, the opportunities and the risks which uh, AI brings. What are the intertwined risks of AI-driven misinformation, disinformation as well, which the report addresses? How is this being played out in many senses even as we speak? So this is a concern that was number 16 last year in the two-year time frame, and it's jumped up to number one uh, in that two-year time frame. And I think it's not surprising because all of us have seen what ChatGPT can do. We've yeah. all seen what kinds of new tools are available. And these are either zero-cost or very low-cost tools, and it means that people have in their hands the ability to create a lot of synthetic content. Now, whether that is used for malicious purposes or not remains to be seen, but it's one of the things that people are very concerned about when almost 4 billion people in the next two years will have some kind of a national or municipal level election that they're going to be making some choices in. So that's one. But there's wider concerns when it comes to artificial intelligence, and I think that's why we see that overall, the broader risk of AI beyond mis- and disinformation, it's only number 29 in the two-year time frame, but it jumps up into the top 10 um, in the 10-year time frame, in part because people are concerned that in the longer term, this could disrupt jobs at levels that we can't necessarily keep up with through reskilling re and upskilling. It could lead to uh, algorithmic bias that then gets baked into how decisions are taken. And of course, there's also some concern. What if artificial intelligence starts being used in weapon systems and other forms of conflict? So there's a lot of concern what happens in the long term. But in the two year time frame, beyond mis and disinformation, there's very little concern that AI will be truly disruptive. Savia, before we go on, how did um, the World Economic Forum actually arrive uh, at, at some of this data, you've reached out to 1,500 experts. So was it a poll? It's a survey of those 1,500 experts across business, government, civil society, and others. And we very deliberately design it so that it's about 50% from the so-called global north, 50% from the so-called global south. We ensure that there's various forms of um, age representation and very different results depending on younger people and older people. But most importantly, we then work very closely with some of those experts to sort of try to understand why. What is it that led to their particular proposals? And I think that's what gives sort of the rest of the qualified information. I think maybe one other piece that's important to highlight these are not predictions of the sure. future. The future is very much in our hands, but what these are are assessments of the likelihood and severity of certain global risks. And now, of course, it's up to global leaders, including next week, to come together to address some of these. Is there a big divergence between the sexes in um, what men and women think about uh, what the biggest uh, threats are? Is there a big divergence between the North and the South, um, uh, rich and poor nations, on, on what the biggest threats are? Yeah, so there's a few differences, which I think the one that strikes us the most is the one between younger people and older people. So younger people are deeply concerned about the cost of living crisis that we discussed earlier in our conversation. There are 55% of them believe that that is an extremely problematic issue. And then those that are over 60, much fewer people are concerned about that. So there's some of that. Extreme weather is another one. Younger people are very concerned about it, older people less so. Um, also, when it comes to the business community and the government community, businesses believe that climate change and extreme weather is a longer term risk. Governments believe it's a here and now risk. So there's a lot of very interesting differences depending on what your perspective is. Sadia, how are global risks stretching the world's adaptive capacity to its limit? 
Yeah, so it's very clear that with this number of risks and with this level of shifts in demographics, in the economy, in geopolitical matters, all of that together, and of course technological acceleration, um, it is testing our ability to react and mm -hmm. to adapt. And to some extent, the global community will have to fire on all cylinders at the same time. And some of that requires, yes, cross-border global cooperation. But we shouldn't forget that a lot of this is in our hands within national contexts. Some of this is up to individuals and individual citizens as to what they can do. And some of this is about coalitions of the willing, about the people across business, government, civil society and others that are willing to come together and say, let's address some part of this issue. Let's take on a breakthrough endeavor. And that's a lot of what the World Economic Forum helps facilitate, including at our annual meeting next week in Davos. How do environmental risks continue to dominate uh, a lot of what you're seeing this year, the risk landscape uh, over all time frames now and into the future? Yeah, so extreme weather is number two, even in the two year time frame. And I think that's not surprising, given that we've just had in the northern hemisphere one of the hottest um, uh, temperature years uh, ever recorded. Um, there's also El Nino is, is back, and that's going to, of course, have an impact as well across weather systems. So there's a lot of concern about what's going to be happening, frankly, even in the short term, and whether a lot of countries that are being affected, whether they have the, really the adaptive capacity, given that they're dealing with so many other challenges. But in addition to that, as you pointed out earlier, four of the top yeah. ten are all related to the environment. There is deep concern what this is going to mean. Are we going to potentially go over tipping points that were previously predicted to be reached much later on? Are we heading into a world where we might reach some of those tipping points earlier? So deep concern from a lot of the participants on that. And I think we shouldn't also forget that climate risks very quickly become societal risks, economic risks. They end up dovetailing with so many other aspects all the way from very specific local communities that end up being affected by extreme weather, all the way through to what that means for crop production, for water shortages and shipping routes. So four of the top 10 presently, but it's the top four 10 years hence. I understand when you say that, look, you aren't predicting anything, but this is where we are headed. And it is truly frightening. You know, 10 years later, we could be having extreme weather events, critical changes to the earth systems and ecosystem collapse, a shortage of natural resources. I mean, misinformation and disinformation goes down to fifth. Um, I mean, clearly, the world's concern on the environment 10 years hence could be uh, much more than we are seeing now. And it's, it's worrying, isn't it? Yes, and I, I think that worry is coming through in all of the experts' ranking of these risks because they believe that not enough has been done. And that is why a decade out, we could still end up having climate risks at the very top. Um, and this is a pattern we have had now for a very long time. I think every year we tend to have the climate risks always as the number one concern in the decade out type of time frame because people continue to believe that still not enough is being done, either in terms of adaptation or in terms of mitigation. And a final question, uh, in terms of the World Deep Economic Forum meet this time around, it comes at a critical time. I've been to, to Davos now for the last five years consecutively. There are so many challenges that the world faces. How is the World Economic Forum much more uh, than an opportunity for um, big companies, big corporates to speak? How is it an occasion or an opportunity to address some of the biggest problems, the biggest issues and the biggest developments anywhere in the world? So we believe that there's three key things. Um, one element is in a world that is so fractured, so fragmented, where so many people are focused on inward looking issues, um, they're looking primarily at their own domestic settings. It's so important that global leaders across different stakeholders are simply connecting with each other. It is a basic, but it's a fundamental prerequisite for building trust. There's a second element, which is starting to build out some of those coalitions of the willing that I mentioned earlier. It's important that um, leaders are able to come together and those that have the in inclination actually start developing the kinds of breakthrough endeavors that are needed, whether that's on uh, procuring the best climate technologies or whether that is on um, reskilling and upskilling people that need that kind of um, workforce development when there are risks from artificial intelligence. And then there's the third element, which is 
tracking and accountability. So we need to ensure that some of those initiatives, and you've been coming for five years, so you've seen that there's a number of new coalitions that are released each year and a number of things which make, we make progress on. Next week, you can again expect to see that there will be progress and advancement across the things that were previously released and new things, including our Artificial Intelligence Governance Alliance that will try to address one of those key topics that will be coming up. All right, Sadia, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you know, spelling out what some of the world's biggest concerns are with this landmark report, uh, you know, ahead of the, uh, the summit. It comes out every year. It's fascinating all the time. Thank you very much for sharing some of the biggest concerns. Thank you.